This is the Investor Connect podcast program. I'm Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, and many other investors for early stage and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today we're here with Drew Tulshin of Upspring. Drew, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Hall. Appreciate the opportunity. So what was your background before investing in early stage companies? So most of my career has been involved in entrepreneurship and startup efforts. I got an MBA from University of Washington uh, quite a time ago, a different uh, century and millennium. And uh, after that, I had the opportunity to work with a Bluetooth company. And those who are old enough might remember before Bluetooth was a thing. And we called it building a train station and the train never arrived at that time. So I got to really learn and do a lot of really wonderful things working with the CFO, raising capital, investment, Series A, a lot of things like that. But we ended up with a product and no marketplace, which is, as you know, one of the biggest problems in, with startups. Great. So what excites you right now? What excites me right now is the opportunity that our current economic situation and the difficulties of the COVID world are providing. There are... Uh, a great chance to go into new marketplaces, right? So some businesses and some business sectors can really speak to what customers need and what communities need. So um, technology, things that allow us to be remote, such as doing this uh, interview right now, uh, local food systems and ensuring people get healthy and good food, Uh, local economies and people buying and selling from each other. Those are the things that I think are very interesting now and really important for entrepreneurs and for investors, particularly angel investors, to be coming together about. Great. So you deal a lot with investors and with startups. What's your advice for people that are investing in startups? What do you tell them to do before they write that first check? Well, I'm one of those people as well, right? I'm an accredited investor myself. I'm relatively new to active investing. So I can really only share kind of my own personal experience and I need to learn from others and listen and ask questions. So that's to not feel like I I have all the answers and to be able to ask questions and admit that I don't know something. But I really believe that it's fundamentally about people. You can have a wonderful technology, you can have an amazing company, but if the people are jerks or they don't have the right people in the boat, I don't think those things are going to get very far. And so I really look at who who's introducing me, what are the people saying, what do they do with their other experiences the rest of their time, what do they volunteer with, who are they as a whole person, and what's been their track record. So that how, that's what I usually end up looking at most before I write a check, and that's what I suggest other people do as well. Great. And so on the other side of that table, what's your advice for people running startups? What do you tell them to do before they go out for funding? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm trying to think of a specific example share with you because I think it depends on the evolution and the stage of a company. But to give you a couple universals that feel really true for me, one is I find, particularly here in New Mexico, which is a smaller market, sometimes you have some solopreneurs. So you have an amazing person who's been working really hard at an idea. They're very passionate about it, but you find that they don't really have a team behind them. And so then my question is, do you not have a team because it's too new and you haven't had time to recruit them? or because you're worried you don't have the money, and so you haven't been able to bring in people with an economic exchange? Or is your personality such that you're just not good at getting other people going, and you're really good at your thing? So that's something that I always check for, and I always encourage entrepreneurs to think about who else, even if you're early stage and only have advisors. The second thing is, just as it's people, don't overstate. If you're an entrepreneur, Don't go into a meeting talking the whole time. Uh, Be willing to listen. Have it be about a conversation and a relationship. Ask questions of other people and be willing to state, I don't know that. There's no reason why an entrepreneur should know everything. They're really good at some things and there's things they haven't gotten to in life. Very good. So let's talk about the state of investing in startups. How do you see the industry evolving? It's certainly undergoing change these days. And what changes do you see coming up? Let me try to make three points and see if they're cogent here. And if not, you can prod me on them. Number one is certainly technology and crowdfunding is an exciting trend. I think that's a little less in the angel space and for some startups, but it's one that I really 
support because it allows entrepreneurs that maybe have a public following or have a long, a lot of relationships to be able to do the democratization of capital and get lots of small money, which we've seen in politics can be very powerful. So I think crowdfunding, particularly for smaller efforts or earlier stage, can be a really powerful tool. A lot of the venture community isn't quite as enamored with it. And there's a little bit of perceived conflicts that I don't think hold true, but it is a challenge. But for someone just starting out or with certain relationships or with a good product, it's a really good thing. So crowdfunding would be the first one. I think the second one that's really valuable is collectivity or collective action or collaboration. Again, here in New Mexico, we got a very small market. There aren't that many good startups that are doing things that other national entities would respond to. But if everyone just did a little bit, particularly with their Rolodex and their relationships, in addition to a modest check, you can get a company a lot further down the road than you would otherwise. And that may be different than, say, a more urban market with larger VCs, larger check sizes, and more family offices. So it could be particular to us. And then the third is uh, one of my passions being here in New Mexico and wanting to see local companies is the idea of triple bottom line company, right? A one that is doing well by doing good. And that could be that the entrepreneur understands they want to build a solid company and keep it in a smaller community. It could just be uh, make sure you're hiring people who uh, don't look like just the white entrepreneur, the, the white founder, uh, but are diversity that reflect the community. And also just paying employees a living wage and treating them correctly and having them be part of the company. Well, that's great. Yeah, I agree with you. I think crowdfunding is a great way to raise funding. You know, the, one of the advantages is it brings the wisdom of the crowd to the table. It's, it can be hard to you know, know everything. And so I think sometimes venture capital is a little challenged. But in a crowd, you have so many more perspectives, and it's interesting to see what they get behind. And then, two, it shows broader base support. And at some level, it shows what, what kind of support you might receive on the, on the revenue side when you get out to it as well. And it, it's great to have that, that broad base that goes behind it. So I think it's the way of the future. And in a coronavirus economy, crowdfunding is certainly the way to go because it's all online. And that's certainly a key element of many businesses coming up is they, they have to have a they have to be COVID-19 proof and be able to operate with or without the, uh, the pandemic shutting things down. And, and so I think it's got a long legs to it. And then on the triple bottom line, I've seen a, a long term, long time shift from nonprofits to impact investing triple bottom line companies. And I think that's, a, that's for the better because I found so many nonprofits struggling to make ends meet when all you can do is live on uh, donations. And if you actually have a, a revenue generating product that just takes the impact so much further, there's just a smarter way of doing things. So it's a great evolution of the market to put in triple bottom line businesses and shift from tough to run nonprofits to impact, which, which has a built in engine for keeping the lights on for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to benefit a community a society, the environment, or just have products that are going to have lasting value. And one thing you said that just popped into my head is, you know, with interest rates so low, it's really an interesting opportunity to think about a wide range of investing activity and not just trade equity. I agree. I think there's many ways you can structure a deal. I'd love to hear more about what you think are going to be the, the winning structures out there but equity only is very good when you know the business is going to go all the way and be a very very large return. Yet so many businesses, you know, they don't go all the way. They go halfway and then they go sideways, and the equity payout probably isn't going to be enough to compensate for the risk. And so hybrid and other other tools become better at it. What what's your take as good alternatives to just pure equity? Yeah, I, I really like this topic a lot, Hall. We could probably talk for hours on it. But just to give a couple snippets and then maybe some resources for people to, to look elsewhere. One element is uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that they don't have experience on this, right? We're very lucky if we can do an exit or two exits or three exits and have the experience. So why should an entrepreneur without the data points, without the, the life experience, be able to get some of these things like structuring completely correct? They're looking to their, their board members, their investors, their lawyers, their accountants to give them this guidance. 
And I think we deserve to have a wider diversity in successful models. The SAFE has come up to be um, more seen, at least on the coasts. I don't particularly like it, but I do respect the fact that you're building a new tool that's starting to get in the vernacular and a little bit more accepted. I think things like shared risk, where uh, people can get some revenue or dividends upside as you go along, I think that's interesting. I think a time period, I talked to a person who was looking at a three-year timeline, and since some investors or some entrepreneurs can't manage, that they created specifically a tool so that entrepreneur, there was a way to get an exit after three years. And I think being able to be alternative and speak to different risk return profiles is valuable. And I also think that businesses that aren't on a venture path that are more the singles or the doubles or the lifestyle, there's no reason why they can't be successful and benefit from angel and investment efforts. And we can't collectively look for the win-win-win, meaning the, the investor wins, the entrepreneur wins, but then also the customers win. I think certainly the, the data bears that out, that not, not every deal is going to be the top 2% with the big equity exit, and that there's many other outcomes that come into it. You know, there's just too many exogenous factors in these startups to bet on the, the final outcome being just a, an acquisition. In the end, only 16% get bought by anybody at the end of the day. The other 84% just just carry on or, or shut down. And so having other exit points would certainly attract more investors into it because right now it appears to be an all or nothing. And it seemed like it'd be wise to come up with these other structures to attract more funding. So many you know, startups are looking for funding, can't find funding, but then not realizing the deal they're offering is really not that attractive to investors. And so we have to make it more attractive to get the funding they need to go forward. Yeah, I like that a lot. How I'm thinking about a sports analogy with Ricky Henderson, right? A baseball player. And he, if I'm remembering right, I don't have the numbers that you have, but his on-base percentage was really amazing. And once he got on base, then his chance of scoring a run was much higher. If you're a home run king, you're also often a strikeout king. And I, don't, I think that model is good for some business models, particularly in the venture world. But I think for angels we have a different uh, equation and a different calculus. And so why should the documents that are popular with a venture VC firm, why are they going to necessarily serve me and other small investors? And that's certainly a good point. So, so let's talk about your investment thesis. You talked a little bit about triple bottom line companies and so forth, but tell us more about what you, you're looking for when you invest in a startup, yeah. both criteria as well as your thesis. Yeah. So again, when I did my MBA, one of the jokes in the VC world was, what are the three most important things in a startup company? And the answer is people, 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 one, two, and three. And it's trite, but for me, I believe it's very true. Who is the entrepreneur? Who do they know? How do I know them? What's been, how have they shown themselves in the past, particularly in stressful situations to show their true colors? And what else do they do with their time and their interests? So that's something that I look at very closely. And then in terms of an investment thesis, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, if you haven't been out here, come on out. We'll get a, a, a tourism commission for everyone we recruit. But the three things that are important to me are building a strong local economy here that can get beyond just government and tourism. So a company that can do things in New Mexico and wants to stay in New Mexico is valuable to me. Number two is that it's more than just making a widget, making it be the best widget, but that widget is doing something for the world that the people and the employees of the company care about participating in their community, or that when you make the widget, it's not going to leave the world in a, in a, in a worse place environmentally. So those are important to me. Personally, I uh, have had some experience with some companies in the immersive entertainment. I am working with a company right now called Electric Playhouse in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, it's a digital software company, but they really care about healthy, active play for kids and families. And then I also spent years with a New Mexican phenomena called Meow Wolf, where we grew the company from $3 million to $250 million valuation in about four years. And we grew it from 50 employees to 500. And so understanding desirable entertainment that this 
generation is valuing experiences over possessions and also the concern about America's over retailedness with the growth of Amazon and other online activities and that we're going to have a lot of empty spaces. So how do we create new meaningful community space, what we call a third place, right? You've got the home, you've got work, but then how do you also take some of these retail environments, which the mall was a mecca for people many years ago, and make them meaningful places outside of work and home for people? So those are the things that I've been focusing on now. Well, that's great. Immersive entertainment sounds like a a great new place to invest. What would you say is your key criteria for investing in an immersive entertainment deal? What, what do you think separates the winners from the losers in, specifically in that sector? Mm, that's a good question. I think the honest answer is I don't know. It, it's been evolving. You know, when I'm talking about immersive entertainment, I'm talking about everything from a public company like a David Buster's, which is fundamentally a bar and a restaurant with some video games. Bowling is making a huge comeback. And there's incredible chains that are growing very, very rapidly. Here in the Southwest, we've got a place called Main Event. And I'm very appreciative of that management company, what they've done with their brand and how fast they've grown. And then there's more unique offerings like the Meow Wolf I mentioned. There's one called the Museum of Ice Cream, which also raised some serious uh, private equity capital. And then something like a Cirque du Soleil, which is probably better known out of Vegas now, right? I mean, these folks were ubiquitous, literally, in Vegas with the number of shows. So I think what I look for is the resumes of the founders, plural, and who else is involved to have a well-balanced team. I think the brand, both in how the brand looks and what they're creating, because I think that there's a lot of folks in immersive that are creating some really generic stuff and they can make a bunch of money out of it. For example, some of these bowling alleys with hundreds of locations, but I don't find that terribly interesting. And then the third is, how are they connecting with customers and what else are they offering them? So what else beyond just a single experience one time are you going to do? So that makes you want to come back, that makes you want to tell your friends and makes it more of a relationship rather than a transaction. Very good. Yeah, thank you for that. So in general, what do you think the challenges are for startups that you fund face? What is the common thing they're all trying to solve? I'm thinking, I think that's a great question. You know, the point that jumps into my head, which is exactly what you asked, is that I know some really capable entrepreneurs, and some of them are young, or some of them have an experience set that doesn't allow them to do everything that's needed for a startup company. And so it's more about them being able to problem solve them, us as investors, helping them with the Rolodex and with a network to get the experts they need to do something. So for example, IP, right? If you've got a young entrepreneur, I don't see any reason why they should be an expert in being able to protect their intellectual property. But helping them to find the best legal advice and to do that most auspiciously and for the best affordability, that's the puzzle, right? I don't need my entrepreneur to be an expert in how to protect his or her or their IP, but I do want them to be able to ask the right questions and quickly be able to solve that puzzle. And so those are the things that, again, in a smaller market like New Mexico, you might not have quite as much expertise. And those are the problems that I see reoccurring for our small businesses here. Well, very good. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here today, what else should we cover that we haven't? Hmm. One of the things I'm super interested in is... How do we each do a little bit for collective action? If you take the COVID situation, you and I are talking about this April and things are changing very, very fast. But if everyone could do a little bit, how could we help our economy be moving healthily again? And so I'm very interested in angels coming together to be a little more transparent than angels historically have been. Also, how they can do more together. And then the third thing is, how could we have employee ownership? There's a great organization out of the uh, Bay Area in California called Project Equity. And the puzzle they care about is what they call the silver tsunami, that you have all of these business owners who are retiring, particularly in manufacturing, light manufacturing, 
And the kids are off doing trades, you know, doing other things and are not going to take over the business. So what's going to happen to these businesses if the employees could participate in the ownership and the financing of these businesses? I think we could tackle some of the COVID-led problems and also some other really cool ways of growing businesses to be successful. And I'd love to work with other people about that. I've heard people use revenue-based funding to transact the generational change from one group to another. You know, someone puts in to buy the business from the father, but they have to pay out a piece of the revenue as part of the process. So the father's still, you know, committed to or incentivized to make that business succeed at some level, help them in some way. But at the same time, once the, the revenue funding has been completed, the, the complete ownership has now been passed over, you get halfway through and stop. Well, then you have equal ownership, so to speak. But I'd be interested in talking further about some of the other models you have there for how you might transact that. Have you heard of any others? Yeah, I really like that one a lot. And so I appreciate you bringing it up. So Project Equity, again, great organization. You can check out the website. They've done some studies and some reports. And they've got some real examples. The other thing that was really interesting is after MBA, there was a a time when I was doing alternative lending. I got to work in what they call microfinance, banking for poor people. And I got to work in capital market activities. When we were looking at successful capital market tools like securitization and trying to apply that to different contexts. And uh, one of the things I discovered is how lending works in the Muslim world, which I think is very far from the American experience. But because in the Muslim belief, and actually the the Christian belief as well, is you're not supposed to be ursurous, right? You're not supposed to charge extensive financing. They have a number of really great shared risk and shared rewards portions, which I think have been part of the American experience historically, particularly in rural economies, such as helping a farmer and then you get a percentage of the crop. But in the American venture 21st century economy, those are less seen. And so I'm really motivated to help entrepreneurs think through what their business model is, what the economic opportunity or the revenues from that are, and then apportion investments that are appropriate for that and then returns that satisfy everybody. So rates so low, there are some people who might be motivated by some sort of IRR that's consistent over a period of time, like the example you put, like where people kind of buy out over time. And I encourage us to think about those things. And I encourage lawyers to be respectful and thoughtful about trying to be able to create things that will, that will be fair for everybody. Well, those are fascinating topics and appreciate you sharing with them today. And Hope to have you back for a follow-up soon so we can dive into more of those. But in the meantime, how best for listeners to get back in touch with you? Yeah, thank you. People welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to chat with entrepreneurs and investors. I love this stuff. And if I can be helpful to someone, even with my opinion, or see a deal that I wouldn't have seen, I'm very appreciative. People can reach me by email. The company is Upspring. That's our consulting firm. We're upspringassociates.com. My email can also be Drew at socialenterprise.net. And I give you just a quick shout out that if you want to check out something new that maybe you haven't seen before, there's a great network of triple bottom line companies called B Corps. And there's something called the Beehive where folks are listing their products and services. And it's a really easy thing to check out for entrepreneurs to get inspiration and for investors to find some new opportunities they might not have seen before. Great. We'll put those in the show notes and want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I want to give uh, 10 Capital a real shout out for doing the work you're doing. I think it's really valuable and I think it's become more important and I'm pleased to to know about it. And if I can contribute to this community, I'd be very happy to. Great. We appreciate the kind words and hope to work with you in the future. Great. Thanks. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Alti Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Investor Connect. 
This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for the basis of investment decisions.